Welcome to Imaginary Wetness Days. Tonight we celebrate an album. Or is it a book? Or a manifesto? Or is it a movement? Is it a guy at soundcheck slapping you across your face for using the F word or the S word? Or maybe the guy pulling sweaty, drunken, bushy men off of nice girls who are in the front row just trying to enjoy the show. That and more in this exciting episode as we explore the odyssey that is the album Humble and Briley Aint by Jesse Danger Arusali on the eve of this album's 10th anniversary. Stay tuned. Yo! Well, how about that? <sighs> you can't beat that with a baseball bat. Um, yo, hey. Thanks, everybody, for sticking around. I'm sorry we're showing up to our own party late. <laughs> but, uh, well, hey, uh, I had one computer die and another thing uh, not work at all. But I'm so stoked to see you guys here. And Shep, what's up? Mean Joe Tunes, what's up? We got all the homies. Um... Had a whole slew of fun technical difficulties, but um, we got through it. We got through it, and we're here, and we're super fucking stoked to be here because, um, Jesse, uh, we're here whether you like it or not or you know it or not, but we're here celebrating one of your albums. My favorite album of yours, I think. Your My favorite solo Jesse album. It's a hard one to wrestle. I love all of your children equally. But this one contains the most of your lovely features and your sense of humor. And it acts more like when we're doing like a like a late night hangout on tour. Um, and it, for me, it feels like a personal conversation that we, we would have. Uh, I'd say um, for me, like definitely Jesse at, at its essence, you know. That is so nice of you to say. I really appreciate that you took the time to memorize the speech I wrote for you. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think you nailed it. Hey, what's up, Stuart? Stuart Stuart's Fanny, in Halifax, the house, man. Welcome, Chokulees. Chokulizard. Yo, what's Choke, what up, what up? Yeah, I can't believe it's been 10 years since this record came out. And this is really... the eve. This is the eve of the of the original release. Yeah, yeah. March 10th, 2011. My sister's birthday. Also Audra's birthday, who's on the record and on my most popular single for sure. From the record. Dope, dude. Dope. Um, here's a funny comparison. Uh, when re-listening to this album now. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. By the way, as uh, Pritchard. I just got these back from Pritchard. He was checking them out. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to show you, he was amazed. He's like, he's like, there's a book that comes with it. And I was like, yeah, dude. So he was checking it out. Um, beautiful piece, wicked forward, fun forward by, uh, buck 65. Um, yeah, man, look at this. My sexy rap portrait that photo dude, was taken it's... by, by taken by Jeff Yan, homie here in Ottawa. So good. And it's it's rare nowadays, too, to even get, like, a lyric sheet. So it's dope <laughs> to... Yeah. Hey, Grown Up Mike, you didn't miss anything. We just started the show, like, mad late. Um, Yo, do you, uh, remember that, do you remember that hat that I'm wearing in the photo? From It's from a London, it's from in London Ontario. Uh, the first time I met Pete Meads, he took us to this artist who had painted on a bunch of hats. And Kill's got one with oh. a stump on it. And there was a Word Burglar shirt... Or there was a shirt made for Word Burglar that said, 
F B words get money. And he was like, Oh my God, do I have to wear this on stage? I'm not comfortable. Whoa. Yo, who was the artist? Do you remember? Um, I remember it was a, a young woman <laughs> and I loved that. I bought that hat with all my tour money. That beautiful <laughs> little chickadee. As we do, we often blow our, uh, our little funds on the few cool things we find along the, along the road, especially <laughs> on, especially clothing. Cause we usually end up stinking up half of our gear, <laughs> but I actually remember the artist. I know her too. Um, and her name just came up last week in conversation. So that's like super, super funny. Um, yeah, Nufisaurus, we, we we feel you. Like, we can't believe it's 10 years. I mean, I'm thinking about an album. I It was Kristen Waterworth. Exactly, Choke. Nice work, dude, I was going to say. Well um, I love that chicky hat. Yeah, well done, Choke. It's dope. Um, hey, so I have a bunch of questions um, after going through this again. And, um, yeah, I, I wanted to say, like, I don't know if I mentioned this to you or if I just said this or not, but like to me, it kind of reminds me of like your version of um, like Edon's Beauty and, and the Beat, right? And I mean That's that in like it doesn't sound anything like that, but like in the way that it's like uh, it's it's so thought out and so dense, and there's so much consideration to the vocal treatment, um, the scratching in it, which I know you don't like. You you did the scratches yourself on this. Oh. Yeah, I. I kind of like it. I just know that it could have been better if I got one of the homies to do it. But I was, I was so isolated from the rap, or like back burner uh, geographically at the time because I did most of it in Edmonton and the last bit in Ottawa as far as like composing it. And then I did record the vocals in Toronto mostly with Kills, but um, you know the DJs were just hard to pin down, and I had. The records i wanted to scratch um yeah yeah so I, I i i put on my bad dj budget cuts uh outfit and i did what i had to do there's even with like the sort of remedial scratches there are there's a lot of editing that i did to like you know make make my attempted tricks sound more like they landed um <laughs> there but um scratching wise actually one of the things that i'm proudest of just to like get this out there ASAP is on the song um, Hot Commodity on the second side of the record um, the sad song about uh, porn yes is, uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so my the record I scratched on that um, has a great hip hop and other music uh, history but I don't know that the part I scratched is has been um, sampled or used by other people before um, right okay the first place, um, the first place I heard the part that's well known was Prime Minister Pete Nice on his diss track to MC Search after they broke up. He sampled, I think, from Morrissey, um, a woman's voice saying, "You are sleeping. You do not want oh, to believe." Oh yeah. And uh, a little bit after that, I heard the third bass track that also used the same sample. And it's the exact same part that the Smiths or Morrissey also used on Rubber Ring. And I found out what the record was that they had sampled. Like, I assume that, um, I assume that third bass just used the Smiths record because it's the exact same part and it has the same degradation on it. Um, but it turns out that it comes from a, uh, a, uh, a record of EVP, uh, electric voice phenomenon, which is this wild mm. scam um, from, you know, early electronics where people said that they could hear ghosts in all of the, like the faintest part of the radio waves where there weren't really signals. And they would go to the, all these, all this trouble to like isolate sounds. And then they would say, well, once you're dead, ghosts speak every language. So phonetically, if it sounded like anything in any language, they would say that was what it was. And in like this great manual by Constantin, I can't remember the doctor's last name, um, the fraud doctor's last name, but uh, he had this whole record of examples. Like here, here are some 
recordings that we got from these radios that were not detuned. Like, they were like detuned from any station and we filtered the sound and we played it through all of these things. And we, we isolated these ghost voices and they were speaking a combination of German and Polish. And, uh, and so it would play like the indecipherable, like ether bouncing off of like a radio tower, whatever it really is. And then a woman whose job was to like recite what they claimed they were hearing says, Du so was, this nicht glaube. Um, I don't remember all of the, uh, the parts in the other language, uh, but then she says the English translation, which is, you are sleeping. You do not want to believe. You oh. are burning people. Spit on it. What? What? Yeah. And so I, uh, I used both parts. I used like, cause, I, and her voice is so like classic to me because of the places I've heard it sampled. It was amazing to hear her others say other words. And yo, know, I had to, okay, to get this record, I had to do a bunch of research and I found a bookseller in the UK who had a bunch of old copies it, it, of the, of the, of the tome that described the phenomenon that came with this example record. And they sold me the example record separate for five pounds. And I borrowed my partner's other boyfriend's visa card, <laughs> my ex partner's other boyfriend's visa card to pay for it. And the British bookseller told me to uh, email them the credit card number. So I did. And within seconds, hackers had Fuck. compromised the card and stripped it from the email and got, and like Visa caught it and shut it down. And this poor guy, I mean, fuck him, but he, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love that's it. I love that's it. separate. But yeah, his, his credit card got shut down and it was my fault. And that's the story of the Holy scratch on that fuck. record. That's why no other DJ could do it. I needed to get somebody's credit card compromised for an English uh, ghost book. It's fucked up when you go to all these lengths just to do something that's quite, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a simple idea. No one even has any concept of how hard you're working on, on an album. But like you, sometimes when I, when, I, when I encounter this kind of that much bullshit, just for one little thing, I'm like, what's the point of doing anything? You know, like it, it puts me in that, like, like maybe this is a sign from the universe that I just shouldn't be making. You know what I mean? I get that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like during um, the process, I can get that feeling. But then once it's done, yeah, usually yeah. I'm like, no, that's my favorite part. And I feel like I love that. Every time I hear it, I know the scratching could be better, but like, I love how I got that record. And totally. It's also like part of why I'll do something like make a book or want to talk about the 10th anniversary is because, yo, yeah. I, I, I went through some hurdles. <laughs> some crazy shit. Um, no, I'm, I'm going to interrupt for two seconds and say what's up to my homie Longhair who knows about some crazy shit that we went through that, together to produce some albums. <laughs> uh, maybe we could get into that and get, and get him on the show to even talk about that at some point, but he knows about some crazy shit that he went through to help me and Bluebird make an album that just kept getting deleted. But um, yeah. So, hey, I wanted to ask you, I think the reason why this feels like the most Jesse, Jesse, Jesse thing that I could get, which sounds like a band uh, or maybe a dirty movie. Like Jesse, Jesse, um, Jesse, like Tony, Tony, Tony. Jesse, Jesse, Jesse thing. <laughs> but um, is that you, you produced all the beats on it, right? Am I right? Every single one of them. I mean, uh, Tim, I said no guests. It's a co-production. Yes. Um, when I uh, I showed up in, in London, and kind of surprised him by accident. He wasn't expecting me, and I really you just showed up. I called him while I was on the Greyhound, and I was like, "Can you pick me up?" And he was like, "No, I'm on a date right now. We just said sometime we should do this." And I was like, "Oh, in my head, I thought it was probably <laughs> going to be this weekend." Um. So he very kindly, well, he. He, uh, he was like, I can come in a while. So I, I went to the record store and bummed around for a while. And I bought half the records that we sampled. Um, That's dope. And you, beats. yeah. And you guys yeah. were just like, like that trip, you bought a bunch of records and sampled them and made the beat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I didn't want to like cart a whole bunch of records on the Greyhound to sample. Oh, I love it. 
and uh, we actually got some really good stuff. That uh, well, well that, that kind of leads. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, that song, um, Tim. I said no guests. Samples three different, no, four different main records, and all of those I bought on the trip. The drums I can give away. It was like a record I already had that I knew had drums on it. It's uh, um, uh, Diodato, the 2001 album, the one that has uh, September 13 on it. Cool, and the drums cool. are from the same track that uh, Camp Lowe made Park Joint out of, or Ski made Park Joint out of for Camp Lowe. So they're kind of known drums. But yeah, and the other records are like a jazz guitar record, uh, a soul record is where the horns are from. And the bass is from the, the original score of The Thing by John Carpenter. So what does it feel like to be a thief? <laughs> oh, I mean, it's like you've never lived until yeah. you've, <laughs> until you've uh, stripped somebody of their intellectual property. Well, that's the thing we talked about. <clears throat> we used to talk about this a lot about um, like how hip hip hop is more punk than punk <laughs> and, um, because like literally to make real hip hop you have to steal and you're stealing yeah. from people who essentially stole from you in a lot of ways because it's like you know especially if if you're a black artist and it's like black music was stolen and turned into rock and roll and then mm. you're just stealing it back from the man who fucking made all these records out yeah. of it and then you know and you're stealing to make your art you know i mean it's like there's no you don't go and buy a guitar you don't go buy like a sample i mean now you do i guess but you don't go buy like a sample of a bunch of vinyls and then be allowed to rip them or whatever the fuck you know like it's, yeah it's and so like punk people, it's such an act of of yeah. yeah zero zero chords three chords f you we know zero chords but like yeah but, but like people do make great stuff with like sanctioned samples and you know just like there's beautiful graffiti on a legal wall sometimes or mm. beautiful spray can art but i do feel right. really differently like it doesn't it doesn't compel me like I can hear a track that somebody's made that way and I might love it just because they made some really dope music. But in terms of like what makes me want to create, I want to find something in a place where it was never expected that somebody would make something else out of it and combine it with something else like that. And right. I'm just like, a, I'm a very reactionary, reactive person. Like, yeah. um, I find it actually hard to write music completely from a standing start it's uh oh sure yeah but like if i find you know something that's at one tempo or in a certain key then i don't even need to know what the key is intellectually and then just try to combine it with different things for a while and then create these new interrelationships that's uh that's its own thing and that's what really like pulls me in as far as making beats and even like humble and brilliant was the first record I had made my own beats on uh, at the time for almost 10 years because I had, it was in the, it was, it was about 10 years that I'd been down with Backburner mm -hmm. and that was like me meeting a whole bunch of people who were doing what I was doing, but better. Yeah. yeah and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I'm not saying time, yeah, as in they were better, no, but yeah, I, there was the yeah. producers and there was the rappers almost. You mm -hmm. know, what I mean, some people crossed over, but yeah. there was definitely the the difference there. You know, and I was both when I started, but I definitely like was excited. Like the beats I was hearing coming from them, I was like, oh, I want to rap on all of these. Oh after, yeah, yeah. For, so for years, I was like, you know, needling Dexter Doolittle and Fester and and Kills and. Uh, Frank Deluxe and like being like, can I rap on that? Can I rap on that? Can I rap on that? And uh, neglecting my own beat making. So when I moved away from Halifax and started like building my record collection up again to try and find stuff to sample, I was like, there's got to be something in me that's waiting to get out. Along those definitely, lines. definitely, definitely. And I can see that. And it's interesting because now like what was the what was the last thing that you prop you made by yourself that was released like i mean you did stuff for bending mouth um what was the last beat that you did you have on a project that had come out before that sorry I it had... might just have been something like much sooner but yeah no like i had a i had a beat on the johnny hardcore self-titled album right and of course, there was the um my my beat and my co-production on the imaginary friends seven inch right yep yep um but other than that i was 
pretty much not making beats in that time. Oh, wait, I had a... No, that was earlier. I was thinking I had a I had a beat on the Passage and Bomar Monk album. But that was like Chokey Lee says Sequestrians. Oh yeah, I did a remix of the of the title track on Sequestrians. Sequestrians is such a good album. Also It's such a good album. Also yeah. my rap on Sequestrians on Old Man Hunger is really good. It's not bad <laughs> on that record either. <laughs> hey, um <laughs> Uh, sorry, man. I'm just hearing some funny shit coming from these guys. Yo, Ginzu's up on here, too. Uh, Deadly <laughs> Stare says Sloppy Doctor. Sloppy Doctor, too. So, oh, word. Word. You, you're also Yo, good at remembering stuff. Thank you for caring about me. There was also songs, I think, that I was doing live that I had made some beats on, but really from about 2003 to, you know, to 2010 or whenever I finished working on this record, I hadn't put anything out. That was my right. Name. Right. Okay. So I wanted to talk to you about that kind of like the process of, you know, I know it took a long time and this and that, but like, what's the, what's the, what's the things that really got, you know, a lot of people in here, they're involved in making music, but I know there's a lot of people, half the people who aren't. Um, what, what's the bullshit behind the scene? Like what's the stuff that took super long? What's the stuff that made you feel like mad at yourself? like you know what i mean like i know what these are uh from my own personal approach yeah um yeah uh like what were the complications what was the intended package what did it end up as if you can explain it in i know it's this i know this is a can you do it long story short i'll do it because i know that i know there's tons of fucking stories in there but yeah, these but people think, need to know i think i can i think i can encapsulate it because um so it actually was in part born out of frustration with how long it took to do collaborative work a lot mostly long distance and yeah. i was like well if i do it all myself and that's right yeah um then how much could i fuck that up um right i didn't that's have my belief, ad right? i didn't i was a couple years ahead of my ad indeed ad and d advanced edge of the dragons <laughs> diagnosis um, <laughs> nice dude yeah and uh so this making the record all took place in a period where I moved away from Halifax. I went from having three jobs to zero jobs. Um, I was moved in with Audra in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. And Audra was like my publicist, A, and also just very, very, very supportive of my music career. And said, okay, like Audra was making enough money working for a union at that time. It was like, take some time before you get another job. Just make that record. Put it out. And like see if this is a career. Wow. And nice. yeah, it was an amazing opportunity. And I think it's one of those things where like, you know how everybody who says this is how you can own a $700,000 condo on a, Oh yeah. On a that's a, and there's this like line, they all hide. That's like got a giant loan from my parents. Like I was yep. in that privileged position where somebody took care of me, uh, for a few years. I also was selling a lot more records and I also was, um, getting uh, residual income from some licensing at the time. Like my SOCAN checks were actual money. But yeah. uh, all that said, once I was actually on my own and I couldn't blame like on my own schedule and I couldn't blame uh, having to work three jobs or, um, you know, any like even having more than a couple of friends in Edmonton on like using up my time, I discovered yeah. that focus was a major issue of mine. And there were a few different things that, like, the beats came together through record shopping, and um, there were they actually came together more quickly in that in that year or so that I was working on it than they have ever since for me. Like, mm, um, mm. just because maybe I was getting more inspiring records, I was digging in a new pool. Um, I was getting more drums and that helps stuff come together. Um, but uh, when it came to like writing and like finishing verses and, um, and then from there, like doing the administration, I just like, there's like six months at least where, or probably more. Well, going into moving to Ottawa, like uh, even, uh, you know, I lived in Ottawa for more than a year before the record came out. So like, Getting to Kilgore's to record it, I wasn't, um, 
very good at scheduling it or like making it happen. I was, I was really, I was depressed and had ADD and it's at the time I didn't know that was the issue. I was just like, why can't I get this thing done? That means so much to me. Mm-hmm. Um, like that, like the thing that I want to do the most is the thing I will do anything to avoid. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, got really into Fallout Three. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> like, uh, got back into video games, but like, and that was depressing. It was like a lot of stress at home because you know I was being helped to follow my dream, and then I was like letting my dream get a few blocks up the road, looking the wrong direction, and so th- those were like the biggest frustrations was me sticking to my vision, figuring out what my goal was and getting there. And um, just bit by bit, it came together by mid-2010. And it, Kills, was, uh, Kills was working on mixing it, but then I decided I wanted to have it finished for South by Southwest in 2011 because I was about to go there again. And that was like a pretty special place for me. So... Um, uh, Kills couldn't finish it at that time, so he handed it, uh, the the files over to Apt, Dave Plowman, who's been um, involved in some measure on almost all of my records. He has verses on um, on Interalia and Verba Volant, and he had like gone to Toronto and built a studio and learned right. engineering by this time. Yep. So he mixed it, and uh, I rushed the book. I actually I remember like putting the book together on tour, whatever. I was like, what do you mean book. sitting in the bus, stapling them together or no, I actually mean editing. I had like a net book with uh, a right. word on it and I was like formatting everything. And I had, I had met a guy, uh, Kevin best, who was really good at Adobe InDesign. So he laid it out in book format for me. Wow. And I'd met another guy, James Hancock, uh who worked at a printing press here in ottawa and he managed to get me an incredible deal on perfect bound books uh really helped me out with that i uh and so like i put it off for so long and like i was really last minute like sending these files back and forth while i was on tour and um and then when it came to like days before going to texas I didn't have my books in hand, so I sent them to a printer in Texas. And oh, wow. God bless his soul, Les went and picked them up for me from the printer uh, while I was flying there because he arrived like a day before I did to stay with our friend Tiff. And uh, so Les went to the printer and picked up my books and had them for me when I arrived the day of our showcase. I believe I was, <laughs> I believe I was stapling them together at the merch table all night. And yo, wait, so this, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just when I was at the merch table stapling the books together, that was when I met DJ Steph for the first time. Oh, no shit. She just no like shit. came to South by. She knew I was playing somewhere and she came to, like, in person because we've known each other online forever. And uh, yeah, just like yesterday, um, I was looking at an old, like, photos from an old phone. And I found, like, this wild, unflattering photo of me and Steph hugging in front of some MC Frontalot and Mega Ran merch, and I was like, "Oh shit, that was the first time." Steph. Fuck, dude, that's dope. Yeah. Oh man, much respect to Steph, dude. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh man. Um, yeah. that was 2011, was it? Yeah. Was I at that South by? Uh, you were not. Was I at the next one, 2012? Must have been within the next couple of years. I thought it was 2011 that I was there because I remember it was like, this is going to sound fucked up, but I was in LA. My dad was passing. My dad was yeah. not, not oh. well. And I'd taken some time to work on an album in LA. Thanks to actually, uh, long hair again, my homie long hair. Yeah. Um, he, he, he brought me out to work with Katie. I'm sorry to diverge here, but I no, remember. No, no. And then, and then that's what allowed me to go play South by. And I thought it was 2011 because rem- he passed in 2012. So <clears throat> but, I remember walking with you. I remember just you and me at like a mm. cafe in Texas. And you were telling me like your, your, that your dad was unwell. Mm-hmm. It's possible that it was that year, but then, 
because he'd made me keep it secret and then i was like yo at this point it's like far beyond yeah but also here's the other funny thing too i remember like really wanting humble and brilliant and um we took a cab and you were like hey instead of money take this and i was like sounds good to me <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> but i was like you know i didn't give a shit. you know what i mean like <laughs> and it was really dope to have the vinyl because you were also concerned because i remember and i'm sorry to lead into another thing here but we'll figure that other information out there was something to do with the covers there was like covers or not covers i remember something about so what happened there yeah okay if the if it was the vinyl then that was 2013 because the vinyl was a failed crowdfunding. It, it didn't come out on vinyl when it came out as a book and a download. Um, right. Because I tried to do an online uh, crowdfunding and I got a bunch of, you know, wonderful support right away. And then I didn't manage it well or something because it just like died. It choked way before the total that I needed to get the records pressed. Fuck. Um, so, and it, it was actually, you couldn't do Kickstarter in Canada. So it was one called Capipal that my friend uh, at uh, Lederhosen and Lucille told me about, Kristen Muir. Dope. Dope and, name. <laughs> and uh, it charges you right away. So it was like, it wasn't one of those things where if it doesn't, if it's not successful, you don't pay. Um, so everybody had already paid and I was locked in. And plus it was my great dream to do final. So I just like, right. Yeah. Got, got a job at that point. You know, it, it was, it was, it had been time. So I, I, uh, I was working at a, just behind the cash register at a coffee shop for a while, and, uh, saving up to put this record out. And um, so in 2013, it actually hit vinyl, but I did, I went the cheapest I could. I went with a local um, pressing kind of broker um, in Ottawa. Chris, okay. Chris got an Italian last name. So the brokers cool are the ones where they work with a bunch of different people to make the project work. So like the, the master pressing could be done somewhere else and then the actual like yeah. lump production could be done in another. Like, that's what that's what's happened to me for my last bunch of projects. Yeah. Yeah. And like it probably wasn't the 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 best route to go, but because it was local, um, I wasn't going to have to pay shipping, which uh, right. I was scared about. Right. Um, but yeah, they had they got them pressed by Rainbow. Um, I know because of the uh, the test pressings I have. Um, yeah, so uh, Apt did the master master. I don't remember if I got Jay LaPointe to do the vinyl master. There's no way I could have mm. afforded that. Yeah, so, would he? <laughs> I know yeah. he's got he's all set up for like real vinyl mastering, but I think I cheaped out and didn't do it. Oh and, shit! Um, it sounds awesome though. I don't know. <laughs> and I got I got three hundred copies of the vinyl made but i didn't go with them for the jackets i got my homie at the printing press in ottawa to pr to print me the smallest run of jackets he could which was three three hundred okay no. right right and and it was what run of vinyl sorry it was i got 250 <clears throat> jackets and it was a run of 300 records Okay. Right. And uh, so, like, in the back of my mind was, I'm going to run out of jackets before I sell all these records and didn't. Uh, it's like, that was a problem for future Jesse. And, uh, but the, the, I got them printed um, and die cut, but not folded and not glued. So I spent the next two, three years hand folding vinyl every time or hand folding <laughs> jackets every time I ran out. Um, I had this whole technique for like getting the spine right. And uh, I think it was also scored, which helped. But, uh, and I started off trying to glue the tabs and eventually I just invested in a ton of two-sided scotch tape. And uh, there's different copies out there that I know I use different experimental techniques. <laughs> Kira and... says, you spent the years hand folding? You? <laughs> Maybe you had some help? I think, yeah, I definitely had some help. Although I think the Kira helped me with the replacement covers, um, mainly, if I recall correctly. I think I think maybe one time we did have some, a little, uh, a little fire, a little fireman line 
uh, of folding and taping, but <laughs> Kira helped me a lot with that record. Kira <laughs> carried a bunch of that records and mailed to me on tour when I was in the States with, uh, with MC Chris and probably did permanent damage to their back and body. But, um, but yeah, so uh, the community, the community folded those covers. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the artwork, yeah. artwork was by Mike Holmes, uh, who had done a bunch of Word Burglar artwork. Halifax boy, I love him. Uh, yeah, and uh, I asked him specifically, please make something that would look like shit on a CD. I'm not gonna do, <laughs> I'm not gonna do yeah. that tiny baby format. I want grown up artwork. Um, yeah, the the. The monsters remind me of the real Ghostbusters. Feels like that style of. Oh, design. it all kind of does actually. Now that you say it, Jesse yeah. D. Jesse D. looks surprisingly slender on the cover. I think that was like trying to be nice or something. But I look more like myself on the back. People don't really see yeah. the back who got it only online. So fools. <laughs> yeah, you know. the you on the cover looks a little bit thinner but that's cool man what else yeah it's just it's i love care. this artwork i, I love, love this too. artwork um i hope i get a chance to work with mike again sometime he's so so real now he was real Ooh, then too. this guy's me i guess right writing on the walls because yeah. i wrote your name for you that's cool that's true actually that is wait move it to yeah the, move it you to your it? right a little there you go yeah that hand style is by thesis sahib you drew it for me for a t-shirt when i lived in edmonton Right. Uh, I, I have that EPS file to this day. I don't give you permission to use this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just Yo. throw it on the stack of lawsuits. You and the, yeah. the Odato drum. Right, dude, holders. it's so funny because, I mean, dude, it's not as if I haven't relied on my community for way too much. But I remember, like, uh, even the last tour, like, having to fucking hustle to make it to a show in Kingston. You're like... Do you mind stopping in Toronto to pick up my shirts from Choke? And Choke being like, I don't know, man. I don't know what's going on. And like him rushing out to some random bus stop in the middle of nowhere to like pass off these t-shirts that you've had made that were fucking gorgeous, by the way. But like in Choke's just like, I don't know. We had to hustle to get these done. And here you go. I just, I even slept and like all this shit. I'm like, fuck, I'm going to be late for the show. Mean Joe's in the car. I'm like. He's freaking out because I'm driving like super fucking fast trying to get to the show in time. Anyway, it's, it's all good. But like word up to our communities. That's what I got to say. <laughs> you know yeah, what I word mean? Up, word up to my... It takes a village for Jesse D to get anything done. As, a, uh, as does it for all of us, man. I mean, we all, we all need Timbuktu's and Chokes and Joey's and um, Jesse's and James's and fucking... You know what I mean? Everybody, everybody really does. You know, it's fucking dope. Backburner, Animal Street, word up need to be chauffeured around and so do all of my possessions and belongings um hey i was there for a long time too you know so <laughs> it just you know <laughs> till i grew up <laughs> <laughs> one day i'll be like you yeah yeah hopefully fucking not you don't want to um <laughs> yeah you don't want to ride on this one um hey okay so we got the three different vinyls we got all those dope artists um speaking of tim so he is the only other guest appearance right if you don't count Audra, who I didn't just because not a rapper. Right, right. But yeah. So that was a funny thing, too. Like, not trying to be like whatever, but you made this album with, uh, you know, your partner at the time. And then by the time it's coming out, you guys are basically not together as much, right? Yeah, we were, uh, we were at the time amicably separating um, when the record was really by the time we were recording the vocals. Um, oh, Jesus. That, yeah. That, there's two songs on the record that I didn't record at Kills. Um, mm -hmm. The one, uh, the one that's like the the the, uh, the true school grumpy old het, rap head one that's like kids rap true be true to hip hop. That, uh, that you one have I to recorded do it, in Edmonton. Yeah. I had to. It was it yeah. was uh, especially with all of the all of the guff I'd given the truth of hip hop over the years. I had to pay respect, but. Um, and then the one that, uh, the one that Audra and I had written together, it just wasn't finished by the time I did the, the vocal session with Kills and we finished writing and recording it during the time that we were like, I think this is probably like 
coming to an end as whatever it is now. And Fuck. like, Fuck, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty intense, but it it, it was very sentimental. And at the time, um, kind of wound up having some conflict later, not to get into it. But at the time, we were like just uh, moving into different. Audra was moving to Toronto, and I just couldn't I couldn't see myself surviving in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, so I stayed in Ottawa, and so at at the time, we were like, "This is going to change our relationship." We were in an open relationship, so we didn't have to like end or say we didn't like each other anymore. Um, but the like the life that was being described in the song was reaching its uh, conclusion, and then wow, dude, and then yeah. after. Audra moved to Toronto. I, uh, I, uh, my, my sister linked me up with a filmmaker who was like trying to do videos to like bulk up her portfolio. And mm. she chose bring your girlfriend to rap day as wow. the, the clear single. And I was like, I love that song and it's fun. It's going to be weird, but we actually record, we did the video after we, uh, couple anymore. Wow. Um, I went like I went to Toronto and I stayed in Audra's tiny apartment with our cats who who moved with her and didn't stay with me and they're in the video also. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so like it was kind of a it's kind of special to me in that way yeah, more than it's yeah. awkward. Um it's real. It's super super real. Hmm. You know, like yeah. And the the lyrics are all full of um like nods to song lyrics of like songs that we uh shared mm. um mm-hmm. audra like drops some a reference to a spiritualized song or a jason spaceman song and like at the very end when it's like uh uh sun and spring and green forever that's Bill hotel mm. um mm-hmm. like a band that audra showed me i don't know i can't remember what they all were but like there's a lot of like you know, stuff that was like a photo album. Yeah. Right. Relationship. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, thanks for sharing all that stuff. That's like some real serious, serious details that went into your art there. That's fucking real, real life stuff. Um, but uh, I love the beat. I really love that beat so much. I'll tell um, you it almost reminds me of like a BDP kind of a thing, but like wow. new, a bit newer, a bit shined up. You know what I mean? So. So yeah. there's a few layers to the samples on that. The the drums are from a country record um, that I found when I was working at Sam the Record Man. And it was just an artist I'd meant to check out for a long time. And I was not expecting that tough-ass break mm. to open up one of their songs. And actually, mm. um, breaking my own rules, I ripped the CD. I brought, I guess, my netbook to Sam's. Somehow, I don't remember what I was using for a computer, but I ripped the CD um, <laughs> while I was at work and sampled it from that. Uh, oh, well, if it's not 100% vinyl, I'm just going to throw this record in the garbage. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> the, uh, and the, there's, so there's layers of like uh, country slide guitar that come from another source, and there's this electronic stuff that's really chopped up, and that's from a version of Spinning Wheel, um, which anytime you see a cover of spinning reel on a record buy that record. Cause if that song doesn't have a sample on it, something on that record is going to sa- have a sample on it. Anybody or something that you want to sample anybody who's covering spinning wheel is going to, is doing some, something cool. Um, but it's from the Moog record that I happened to also find. Mm. Did I show you this? I told you about it before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the sample for uh, get it together by the beastie boys. It's which so happens. Dope. In the bridge between uh, Let the Sunshine In and Age of Aquarius uh, in a medley on that Moog record. Um, it was, it's like electrifying when you hear that one bar that they sampled that's not really part of either of those songs. Um, yeah, so like I think I heard the part I wanted to sample first and I grabbed that and then I kept listening to the record and that part came by and I was like, oh, I guess someone beat me here. But mm, mm-hmm. And the tap dancing on the record is actually Audra tap dancing. We bought a pair of tap shoes. Uh, Alts, New York. And she could uh, tap? She could tap? Yeah, from, a bit. Uh, from childhood. Yeah, had taken. Actually, maybe up into even high school. I, I think she used to teach like the seniors to tap. 
Dope, 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 dope. I kind of want to rip through, uh, not rip through, I kind of want to go through the idea of this book, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to skim through it. I mean, realistically, you gotta have, you gotta have it and, and read it or check it out on the, is the online version still available for people when they, uh, no, I'm going to reprint it. Um, because there's, I don't even have a copy at all. Okay. Well, you got a dope intro from the legendary buck 65 of uh radio two uh <laughs> rich turf fry something about a stir fry or whatever what a guy kind of thing doesn't he say that in one of his songs anyways My um name is rich turf fry and i got bigger fish to fry to fry that's right um so which is awesome and to be honest like it's like people don't know but like you guys have been a part of each other's life in a lot of different ways in a very cool way i know he was a big inspiration to you but like you've also being there for him in a lot of different ways. And that's very cool. Um, uh, it's exciting to know. Yeah. I, mean, um, I, didn't, I didn't draw two album covers for him or anything, but. Hey, 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 yeah. I fell victim to that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, oh yeah, hand style on the front, word up. Uh, but uh, dope illustrations throughout this thing, man. So you know who did um, that one, right? London, Ontario. Oh, is this the dude? Yes. Brian Lee O'Malley. That's yep. uh, Scott Pilgrim. Right there. Did fan out of me. That's awesome, dude. That's so cool. Um, hey, uh, where'd you get the idea to do a book with an album? Uh, if you're wondering if I stole <laughs> it from you, didn't I do it? Didn't I do it first? Mm -mm. I don't think so because you wrote in my, well, I don't know. You wrote the preface. Mine came out in 2010, right? Well, then you did it first. Uh, yeah, but we were both. I love this. There's a handwritten uh, download code. Don't look too quick because it's mine. <laughs> it belongs to me. Um, but uh, I remember. Uh, I remember we were both on this kick for a long time. Like li like pre those projects coming out, brainstorming. How do we put out like fuck CDs? That was the thing. Like fuck CDs. We're sick of these things. Mm -hmm. We only like vinyl and we only we like cassettes too. We were both like sick of CDs for since. I mean, fuck, man, forever. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we never even... really, everything we made, we kind of made a little cassette version of pretty much most of the stuff. Um, yeah. I didn't do, I didn't do any tapes at that time. I had been doing CDs throughout like the 2000s, I guess. Like I did right, tapes right, yeah. in the 90s. Mm. Um, and then from Eastern Canadian World Tour to uh, Verbal Volant, it was all CDs. And... There was a while where my CDs were selling well. Uh, part of that was because uh, MC Front a lot had blown up, and with like people who were really, really collecting stuff. And I was a guest on his album around 2005, with when he was right. getting all that attention. And uh, so I sold a lot of copies of Interalia at that time, and even uh, you know I had I hadn't really made a ton of copies of the albums before that, but I had to reprint them, and they all sold. Um, and then when I reprinted Interalia and did I did a thousand copies after selling five hundred copies of Interalia, I had a thousand. I got a grant, and I had a thousand copies of it and um, Verbal Volant printed when that came out. And right. then I still have hundreds of copies of Interalia and Verbal Volant. Like they never, mm -hmm. like my CD sales ground to a halt uh, in the late two thousands, uh, even when I was like. I started trying to give them away and trying to yeah. sell other types of merch. And uh, so, yeah, I just didn't want to do a CD again because I didn't collect CDs. Like, I have a CD collection just because there's some stuff I couldn't get any other way, but I wouldn't seek out a CD as a listening form. So I was like, okay, downloads are here for our digital format, and Bandcamp does lossless as well as any bitrate of MP3 you want. So yep. let that be your digital way. You can put it on your uh, Microsoft Zoom or your right. uh, app, your Apple iPod. And, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then I want to do vinyl, but I still am a collector, and I love artifacts, and I had always wanted to make a book and didn't know what the inside of it should have, you know? Yep, yep, yep. And, but I write, like, li my lyrics are writing, so... And I always would put my lyrics in the, like, shrunk down so tiny you need a magnifying glass. Actually, like, in my, uh, I had gift bags. Um, this might have been Audra's idea, but when uh, when 
Inter Alia came out at the uh, album release show at the Seahorse. We had these like deluxe bags that had that plus the, the previous album and a little like dollar store magnifying glass so you could read the lyric sheet. No way. That's yeah. Dope. <laughs> um, that's and that amazing. was like that was like the thirty dollar gift bag. Um, and and but yeah, so I wanted I always I loved reading liner notes and lyrics. So, you know, even with the non-corporeal version of the audio, like, I want to have somebody to have something to hold when they're going home from the show or from when they buy this, wherever they buy it or acquire it. And, like, I want them to sit and look at it while they listen and think about it the way I always did with the records that influenced me so much. So many times I'd be coming home from the mall, uh, you know, with my new tape. Uh, yep. Uh, like I remember, I have a distinct memory of sitting in, on the bus coming back from downtown because I had bought Divine Styler's um, Word Power on cassette from Urban Sound Exchange. Their, you know, their used hip hop cassettes were unreal uh, in the nineties, and mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and Divine Styler had gone the extra. He had all the lyrics to his album, so it was like a million fold out sheets. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. also he had gone to the trouble of writing them in uh malaprops and like phonetic uh like homophones and stuff mm -hmm. like the words were kind of wrong like words that they so a lot of the lyrics were stu words that they sort of sounded like and uh he was like encouraging the reader to like see past the words on the page and interpret it like more carefully right right and That's dope. that man that blew my mind to like have meta commentary to your own lyrics right and i think that was maybe a big influence on how those l lyrics came out and i i had the idea before you know what before i did humble and brilliant i was working on a book of my prior albums a lyric book and i was annotating everything and i was writing out i, I wrote like hundreds of thousands of words on this project um in the mid 2000s where I was just like explaining all of my rhyme schemes in case people missed them and like pointing out the references that I thought some people might not get once they got other stuff and mm -hmm. I never finished it but um annotation I also was like really enjoyed reading the annotated Alice as a kid uh the mm -hmm. Alice in the mm -hmm. book that has all like everything's broken down and I love artist statements and just more more meta text on art always makes me happy um, and you've got so much of that here. Um, the appendix goes into everything here you've sampled, right? I everything, think so. the, well, everything. It's got yeah, the, it's the voice samples. It's the voice samples, right? It's the voice samples. Yeah, it's because you don't want to give away up. the other samples. I don't want to get, get in trouble. You don't want to. You don't want to get in jail. <laughs> um, yeah, but this is really Hi, beautiful, man. <laughs> Hi, Dad. <laughs> it's your son. I'm in jail. I sampled a record. Now I'm in jail. I'm in jail. <laughs> Dude, that song is so important to uh, to my life now. Us. Yeah. Us. To us. To our man, this is fucking Yeah, I forgot, man. It's been a minute since I since I actually cracked this open because I, I know I got the vinyl separate from the book, right? Um, and then I think I got the book like a bunch like a bunch later. Um yeah, because yeah, that's dude. perfect bound, so it's not the first edition. It's not the more or less uh, yeah. saddle stitch. Uh, right. Us in Texas. This is so nice much one. more. I got the nice one. Well, hey, the other one's more limited edition, maybe. I don't know. But uh, I really love this. You, anybody who's who doesn't have this yet and, and is listening to the album needs this. Um, I, yeah, this is so much more than a than the inner parts of a, a you know, the inner, the inner uh, readings of a cassette or, or CD. But, you know, I used to love that too. And that's such an important thing. That was always my thing. I, the memories of like cracking open the CD or the tape, the tape more likely on the bus and just like, just diving in and then spending the whole weekend or whatever, you know, like looking at the, at the tape for sure. Yeah. Um, a new record, yeah. a new record would really like take up, like it was stepping into a new world, um, the way I would consume them, and I, I don't do that with new albums now. No matter how good no, they are, no, 
I know. And like, I feel a loss that I'm not engaging with records that way because there are records coming out that are just as good, if not better, than records I have that relationship with. But like, they wash over me, and you know, I'll put them on. If the best I can hope for is like, I'll listen to them when I'm walking somewhere or doing some chores, like washing dishes or something, and like, I'll get to really listen. But like that whole like building a little fort around yourself of the liner notes and just like playing mm -hmm. the record on repeat, absorbing it a bit, not finding mm -hmm. the time for that. I know what you mean. I mean, I wonder if it's also aging commitments that we have right now. I mean, I, I do suffer from, I don't suffer. I mean, maybe it's a good or a bad thing. It just is how it is. But I actually can't consume a lot of music at one time. And I have to be careful about, I know this is about your project, but I, I it's just a side note that sometimes I, I some can relate to. But I like music affects me so much emotionally um, yeah. that like if I'm listening to something that's like, you know, depending on my mood, it has to either be with it or against it. Like, that's the other thing, too. Like, sometimes I can listen to sad music when I'm happy and vice versa. But, like, often it has to be, I need upliftment. I'm going to listen to something that's happy right now. I need, uh, you know, I need a, I need, I need a change of energy. You know, I need something. That's, I, and, yeah. and so I, I, I seem to actually stick. Like, I was listening to Dad Bod Rat Pod, and they're going on about all the new albums. You know, and obviously it's three people with the same aim and they've been doing it for three years, but they're covering so much stuff that I'm like, holy shit, man. Like, I don't think I've listened. And plus, it's also like genre specific to hip hop, right? Whereas mm -hmm. I'm like, I, and I'm sure those guys are consuming, consuming tons of different things. But like, um, yeah, um, for me, I find it really hard. Like, and all I can do is... I have to specifically set out that I'm going to do walks or dishes. Like you said, dishes is a way to consume. Um, another weird thing I wanted to ask you about, and I just don't know if this is age, but like if you relate to this, but back in the day when I'd see a movie, like a new movie, I'd go to the theater and I'd see a new movie. It would profoundly affect me. It was like, I would let, I would go into a movie theater and just let it absorb me. And I would think about it and I would think about it at night and then like the next, you know, over the, I, you know, I usually see a movie on a weekend or whatever. So when I go mm -hmm. back to school, it would like affect me and I'd always feel changed, you know, or whatever mm -hmm. I rented over the weekend would kind of change me. And now when I, I mean, it's either yeah, I've grown numb to it or whatever like that, but now it's like, I forget when I watch sometimes movies. I'm like, did I see that yet again? Oh yeah. It has that weird scene with whatever, you know what I mean? Like, um, and unless it's something very strange that affects, like that's, I mean, almost like I look for like, maybe more extremely uh like i mean i love kitschy movies that are just so bizarre you know what i mean like maybe that's the reason why i gravitate to that now too or like um you know something like a david lynch now or something maybe that's why that i gravitate towards that because it actually kind of messes with my feelings you know you feel <laughs> like, like back when you were having that reaction that it was movies that wouldn't affect you so profoundly now or that they were along those like more uh that you were seeing more like affecting movies hard to say i mean really i mean i'm talking like i would get affected by seeing like batman with michael keaton you know what i mean right. like that would make me ooh, i'm feeling this way there was a bit of darkness in there or like i'd feel like uh i remember seeing like et and that affecting me in all types of ways mm -hmm. or like um you know or you see like the second this you know the second terminator and you're like what the fuck you know what i mean or like that i mean i yeah. guess those are all profound kind of movies too but like even seeing like raiders of the lost ark or like the newer one you know like the ones after it and like that affecting you or you know gi joe the movie or like universal shifts you know what i mean and sometimes albums would be the same way and i guess yeah anyways but, that's yeah, a whole I, other yeah i we get uh, the one's palette gets jaded you know like i think we were we encounter so many things at the time that we're forming ourselves and like we can feel those big tectonic shifts like oh i just got formed a bit and right. like we're probably yeah, yeah, not quite yeah. as malleable now even if we are still curious you know right yeah um that yeah stuff that even stuff that's like that is profound might not dig in as deep um i think i don't watch as many like profound movies as i used to like um and i guess like I used to watch a lot more movies. Um, I used to always be with someone, and it's such a communal experience most of the time. Um, and I'm more solitary now, and so it's like work to like sit and watch something, um, unless I'm eating. And uh, and I don't eat for a long period of time, so I can watch like half a show sometimes. Totally, um, totally, yeah. But like my 
friends or like people I was close to, we would be like really excited about cinema. And like when the when the Atlantic Film Festival came out, we'd like go through the whole thing and figure out what the cool movies were and like buy a bundle of tickets and be ready to like have our lives changed once a year or go to right. Video Difference on uh, on Quinpool Road there. That was a big yeah. 24 hours and like they had a whole indie section and a foreign section and like seek stuff out and now i have access to these there's still quite a variety of things probably not quite as hand curated as those mm -hmm. were mm -hmm. like because mm -hmm. i've got my netflix and my uh you know i'm sharing a bunch of accounts of netflix disney crave uh whatever the amazon one is like with people and there's a bunch of stuff there but I, there's not a whole section. I don't want to find myself wandering through the Spanish cinema, being like, what came out in the last year? <laughs> exactly. That, that looks the sexiest. And exactly. So I probably, like, Mar I have easy access to every Marvel movie, but they don't, like, they're not exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Except no, like it's a few true. Seconds. We got the homies chiming in the Mansta and stuff, talking about that too, and actually mm -hmm. giving a shout out to Video Difference. That was a huge. That, yeah. I, I lived on, I lived in Quimpool Towers for almost a year, and like was basically in Video Difference every night, like super late, just trying to find stuff. Um, hey, I wanted to kind of pivot the conversation to keep it going back to your album. Speaking of of watching uh, videos alone, um, your song about porn is awesome. It's crazy. Uh, it That's nails a lot of things segue. on the head. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? It worked. That was totally interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. I mean, it's it's a weird, clumsy song in a few ways. I was working some stuff out. Um, sure, but, but that's, in, that's yeah, that's inter it comes through in there in an interesting way. Because I was coming from a pretty... As a teenager and in my early 20s, I think I was um, libertine. To say the least, I was like, uh, okay. he, philosophically hedonistic. I was like, if it, if it gives somebody pleasure, that's got to be good. And I was just getting like a handle on any feminist ideas. Yeah. And um, just like reading, uh, reading Andrea Dworkin and the the lawsuits. Lawsuit's not the right word. I, I, uh, but like the litigation that and Catherine McKinnon did to, uh, to, you know, to fight porn, and it was really hard to deny the harms that were being described. As somebody who had like looked at pornography uh, recreationally and and had the luxury of tuning out or like moving away from something that I found upsetting, you know, and like kind of right. pretending it's not yeah. there. Um, right. You know, that's a really convenient way to um, pretend that it's not having enough, any effect on me or on other people also. Um, and so, yeah, the song like goes back and forth because I, I don't want to make common cause with people who are like anti-human bodies and want to control women. And but like, you know, both porn and religion distort a person's perspective on women. Somebody pulled that out of the song and it got it circulated on tumblr for years and it shows up on like quote sites oh wow the last Holy line shit. of the first verse um oh shit oh. and like i think that a lot of the times when i talk about religion and i don't know my my views at that age i go back and i wince a little bit at like how much how much i thought i knew everything but also just how much i I don't know. I just like walk in and, and put my boots up on everybody's furniture. Um, but that song is like so self-reflexive and inward looking and uh, outward looking. It feels like it feels like something that I don't know of anyone who's addressed that topic that way in that in lyrics or. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah beats fucking sick yeah 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 <laughs> yeah it is it is it is that whole triptych situation which i want to get into is is pretty fucking sick 
Um, one thing I wanted to say, and you know, this is something we commonly uh, or people talk about more, but um, you know, actually kind of surrounding some ideas with like, I hate even fucking saying this word, but like, you know, the cancel culture thing or whatever the fuck, like, I don't even want to, but like, just looking at art for what it is at that time period with how that artist was feeling in that moment. You know what I mean? And like what you were dealing with, what you were presented with, what the world was like at that moment. And like, that's what you wrote. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's how you felt at that time. And you were doing it, you were doing it with everybody's best interest in, in mind. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, dude, come on, man. I know you. Um, and I can guarantee that you weren't, you know what I'm like, dude, I know it. Um, and that's the, that's the interesting thing is like, for me, this might just seem like an immature story, I guess, in a way, but like when I was going to school f as a graffiti kid in high school, you know, basically just taking art classes as an excuse to why I have spray paint mm -hmm. and, um, taking these classes and finding art history completely fucking boring also not really so into history at the same time but then i go when i move to halifax and i'm lucky enough to be able to uh attend classes at nascad i choose the art history class that talks about history and we pair together why people painted at that time when history what was going on in history and the teacher at the time was so good at explaining the basics of history that wasn't you don't have to remember exact dates you don't have to remember this but like this is what this is the shift the world was going through this is the war this was the belief this was this was the tendencies this was like you know was there slavery was there post-slavery like what was going on what were people's minds you know who was a fucking dictator you know all this stuff and 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 like some of that art it's like if you look at it through the lens of the day you're like yeah it's f like maybe made by a shitty person or mm. they had a shitty outlook or they were you know they uh they were painting people who were maybe in a compromised situation and that's fucked up and it, it is fucked up and it, but like it it is what it was do you know what i'm saying and like i'm kind of going on a little bit of a side tangent here but like i just love that we have a song of what you were thinking at that moment in that place and who you are. To, it's not like you said something terrible in the song. Do you know what I mean? Um, in in no way at all. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, um, but yeah. it's just I don't know. It's important to me. Like, it's important to me to have that. And it, it's it's a dope song. You're saying, I think a lot of really awesome shit in it. So really appreciate. It. I mean, yeah. And I was I was writing those things to connect with people. The working title of that song before I started trying to unify the triptych titles, it was just called a song for boys. And Oh uh, shit. Cool. Like cool. The, I, the idea was, and like, I wasn't, um, it wasn't like a grand statement on gender identity at all. It was right, just right. like, um, you know, the, the way it's phrased in the song is like, how come men can overlook this harm? Um, I just I just wanted people who had who were as insulated as I had been from potentially negative outcomes as something that you know we were also compelled to age with. Um, totally, totally. Just th think of, just to think about like what the what the pros and cons are. And, like don't just don't just defend it because like absolutely because it's uh, pleasurable. Yeah, exactly. And because there is people who we, who are a feminist who, who do say porn is okay, it doesn't mean that it's actually okay in all situations. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like too, too. And it's like, like so important. many things like it's contextual, like you can have ethically and unethically made everything. Yeah, 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 for sure. You know, what's interesting is, um, the blue book that I was talking about of mine that came out with the vinyl record, there's a song on there that like is about porn too. Then and it's, secrecy? uh, no, it's uh, by design actually. By the first design. Song. Right, right, right. Yeah. Sin and secrecy is more of like a coming out kind of song or struggles with that or understanding if it's even important. You know what I mean? Like that kind of thing. Um, but by design is more about the idea of, um, uh, being aroused by, uh, it's mainly still porn, right? But like the idea of like, I wrote it when I was walking through uh, Sw in Switzerland, I was staying at my homie Manu's house and uh, just walking 
to from one area where we did a radio show and then to his house and just passing through the red light district and feeling your emotions change as you're like you know you haven't had any privacy for months and you're, or being with anybody that you're in a relationship with and you're walking through the red light district and just a sign on the wall and how just the shapes can make you like mm. <laughs> have an emotion and it's just like and i think do animals feel that way it's just like it's just ink on a flat surface so right. it's more about like the design of sex or the design of it and what that triggers within you and like how complex that is and you even touch do you even touch on uh, like there's a slight bit and i forget what the words are but you talk about like the like sort of the ingrained uh idea of it being in everything or, or something like that there's some word you there's a, there's a quote you say in there and it's so fucking awesome <laughs> and i was just like shit i really can see it and you know i i hope i'm not looking too much into that but i can really feel that you know like that kind of connection yeah to that um but they, that was always that's always a, a mystery to me when i like you know, uh, you're walking along and you see like a picture of someone beautiful and you're like, oh shit, that's beautiful. And they're like, dogs don't fucking look at a flat surface. You know what I mean? Maybe I their wonder. eyes don't work the same. Do they? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, like, dogs can get horny off of like going to the park though. So, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's a, <laughs> who, who's the real winner there, you know? Uh, exactly, exactly. And what's, and you know, what are we going to do about Lola Rabbit? Yeah, <laughs> word, word. Hey, well, hey, here's the other thing too. Like, you look at um, you look at early uh, early early porn, um, from like cave people and stuff, and it was like uh, like a sculpt, like what was that one, Wilhelmina, right? Isn't that what it's called? Oh, uh, the, the, oh no, the, it's the the, 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 the Venus of Willendorf. Venus, Venus of Willendorf, <laughs> Venus of Wilhelmina, Wilhelmina you forgot, Willendorf. You use a different part of your own rap. Yeah, exactly. But the yeah, the uh, Willendorf thing is just like a stone with some bumps on it. And you're like, oh, I guess so. And you're like, this was like an early jacking off tool. They loved it. They'd put it there and look at it. I'd never and heard I, it suggested in that context. Is that? That's what the art professors at this art history thing were like. Yeah, like this was considered to arouse you. Like they would put it. They would have like mating rituals and stuff like that. And they would have sculptures art professors like that. Are notoriously perverted though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, well, we got a few on here right now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but uh okay, what do we got? We got some homies in here. I got I got like a couple more questions and then we should wrap it up. But dude, um Choke says what song what song is not about porn. Do animals feel that way? Fuck. Uh we got Kara here. Um more or less, man. More or less is the homie. Um I don't Emla Shep says her dog loves looking into the tub. Anyways, okay, cool. <laughs> Sorry we we diverged mainly into the porn song, but I wanted you to quickly explain the triptych and then something that we haven't brought up about the album uh, that you wanted to talk about or something that didn't make it on the album. And then we should say bon nuit to the homies. The triptych, um, the album is subdivided into hemispheres. I was always picturing it final and right. i was working to like kind of a maximum time limit and as i was making it there were songs that were coming out more upbeat and songs that were coming out more somber serious and personal so i divided it into like starting with the most upbeat and like fun rappy songs mm -hmm. at the beginning of side a and then kind of like getting grimmer <laughs> and like mm -hmm. hitting like a midpoint and when you flip the record over and then getting like just disappearing more and more into my feelings throughout the course of it. And there were three at the end. What made them a triptych? Hot commodity, hot property, right. cold comfort. Okay. Um, Temperatures. Yeah. And also they were tracing me through stages in my life. Um, yeah. So it started with hot commodity um which is a song about porn and then hot property was the encapsulation it was looking back at it i realize now it was like straight up like therapy it was uh, mm -hmm. processing the trauma of um big mistakes i'd made in uh, several overlapping relationships uh a few years before I, I address them and tried to write about them and i I set out to write a different song than I actually wound up writing. It was supposed to be my like 
I'm letting go of all this and like I'm moving on song. And as I worked on it, I found how deeply I was dug into so many of the feelings that I had mm. um, just tr tried to move on from. Cause like the first, the first verse describes like me trying to leave someone who um, imprisoned me in my house when I tried to leave, who like used suicide threats and, and violence to like trap me. And then for, uh, you know, to a decreasing amount over time, but like once I did get out for the next 18, stalking me. Right. Like threatening people in my life and like showing up places I was and like, that was a lot to like process. I've never had any, I had at the, had anything like, right. Um, so I'd gone trying to be okay. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then once I started writing about it, um, the second verse opened up into like the people who were around me, who were like peripheral to the situation or involved in different ways and feeling like they had let me down as friends. Um, and there's, I even acknowledge in the song that like, it's unfair, you know, it's, it's coming out of like my wounds and, uh, there's nobody who really gets like directly like in my head when I was writing it, there's nobody who's like the bad guy of the, of my friends. It was just that like people didn't know what to do. And some people chose things that made it worse. Uh, you know, some people really turned their back on me. Didn't. Um, I got some of those phone calls. <laughs> personally. Oh my God. I, I got well, contacted. Yeah. Oh, I forgot how many people must've got yeah wow. that was crazy shit that was crazy shit i mean sorry i shouldn't say those words that was upsetting you know what i mean it was unsettling yeah and, and you can so, you can tell it's just a bogus you know anyways it doesn't matter yeah sorry but oh yeah so by so by the time i was writing the song i didn't know that was going to come out of it and then it goes through a, an interpolation of a disposable heroes of hypocrisy song um and it gets like kind of self pitying, like maybe the whole thing is, but like by the end, I'm just like rolled up in a ball really. And like mm -hmm. talking about like trying to move forward from the place I'd got myself to. Um, not long after I finished, no, while I was working on the record, I went to therapy for the first time and I had the worst therapist. It was actually somebody who like made a joke at my expense, like, or like I describe, I describe basically what's in that song. Like I was trying to like set up all this contest cause I knew like parts of it were really uh, sticking with me and like hard for me to like stop uh, uh, fixating on. And so I told this like series of trauma, people I'd really hurt, people who really hurt me. And I tied into the fact that like I was, uh, I had like no sex drive. And mm -hmm. like at that point in my life, and it was like really bad for my relationship at the time that I was like terrified of sex, period. I couldn't really even talk about other people right. having relationships. Mm -hmm. And when I got to that part, the uh, the therapist I was seeing sort of laughed and said like, well, from what you just told me, maybe that's not such a bad thing. And the like, fuck? yeah, it was really heartbreaking because I was like finally like trying to get help. Yeah. And... Uh, I don't know if I'd written the song yet then, but I kind of feel like maybe that song was me trying to take therapy into my hands. And I wouldn't, right. I wouldn't really recommend that anybody look at it as a historical document. Like it's cause it doesn't like most people who ever hear it, it's out there. Thousands of people have it. They don't, they don't know the other people. They don't mostly really even know me. And like, it's not like really a set, a, an attempt to like create a record of the events. It's just like, processing and i've had people tell me that they relate to it a lot who've been through similar things and every time i'm like so sorry that they can relate to anything yeah that song. yeah like oh yeah even at the time i was like like when it came out and people started reacting to it i was like maybe it was irresponsible to make pe these people come to therapy with me um so that's a really that's definitely the rawest moment on the record and there's sort of an anticlimax in the third part of the triptych or a with cold comfort um 
where I was trying to talk about how I had never been intoxicated in my life mm -hmm. and uh, how I had avoided it and how I was like afraid of it. Um, I try, I, and I, it, it was, it's um, not exactly in code, but it's, um, it's all over the place in terms of like pulling in references to different literature and films I'd seen and like inside ideas that um, were just in my own head. But like, I was, I was feeling like constricted by having an identity. Um, I was like, I don't use drugs. If somebody asked me, would I like a drink? No, thank you. I don't drink. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pass the joint my way. Oh, no, thanks. I don't smoke. And mm -hmm. like, I felt like I'd built this little like box for myself when I was a teenager. And like, I was trying to figure out like, am I not experiencing my, the fullness of my life or am I experiencing more of it because it's not hitting these filters and like, what does it mean? Like, why am I like this? Like, is it, is it just like a sense of moral superiority or like, you know, is it like the experience of like alcoholism in my family? Um, I didn't even really see that part of it at the time I was writing it, but I knew mm. I spent a lot of time uncomfortable around people who were intoxicated. And so, yeah, I, that, it, it was just like, it's also just really depressed and like, which is part of also maybe why, one of the reasons that I'm glad I never did develop the habit of drinking is because of that depression. Even though I didn't have a diagnosis at the time, I was like, this song is about like wanting to not be feeling um yeah yeah so like, I, I, uh, yeah i can um yeah it's interesting it's cool it's like i know i know it's not like you're sitting there in a place of re regret for not using substances or anything like that but it's like it's also it is definitely something to think about you know um yeah. and especially when you think about like depression or or any like chemical stuff that can go on in your body it's like there's a there's a lot of um i'm very happy that i chose personally not to partake in some of the substances my my homies were taking now like now at my age i understand different things i can do that i really enjoy um, yeah. which is quite a bit of a different thing like uh which is a whole other bigger topic um but did you ever consider yourself straight edge? Like, would you go to hardcore shows? I'm just wondering if that was like a big influence and that's got nothing to do really with that song. It's just like mm -hmm. a side question, you know? No, but it, it, uh, it does touch on it because I always, yeah, yeah, I yeah. always identified as not straight edge. Like, right. I, yeah, I yeah, did, yeah. I did go to hardcore shows a bit as a teenager and I didn't feel like it was my scene at all. I just really wanted to be at shows. And like mm -hmm. those were like there were more of them for all ages before I was of <laughs> drinking age, and I, at the mm -hmm. time I was also like I want to go to the bar because someone's rapping there. I promise you I will not drink. You know, once right. I do start getting yep, in yep, there, yep, I'm yep, not going to totally. start drinking either. And like, totally, you know, it doesn't do much for the for the bar's bottom line, I guess. But like, I uh... the thing is, you probably would have put like money in a bar jar you know what i mean that was like hey <laughs> thanks for the show you know what i mean even yeah. though they were taking their 20 percent off the door or whatever the hell it was maybe more maybe not but like i mean i know i know for a fact actually it was weird with me too growing up and 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 i would be i was pretty anti drinking for the longest time because i was always getting my ass kicked by drunk jocks you know yeah. um and but you know little did my parents know i was smoking weed like a fiend but um like I would go to straight edge shows, but go high, you know what I mean? Like me and my friends would smoke weed and go to these straight edge shows. And it was really dope because it was like, I never felt threatened in that way where I would get my ass kicked, uh, walking down the main street here in London. Or yeah, you know, I even got, um, punched up a bunch of times, even in Halifax on, on the main street there too, you know, like by a bunch of drunk, you know, on like spring garden or yeah. Something? Yeah. Spring garden, believe it or not, you know, like that's um, the most violent, like the, all the places they tell you to avoid in Halifax does not have high rates of violent crime. It's downtown where the it's students are. It's downtown. Yeah. yeah, well, those right. guys will do violence to uh, guys like me and, uh, you know, women. <laughs> you know? Um, uh, yeah, I remember one of the first memories after moving to Halifax, like, you know, hanging out, just being in the North End continually, uh, never having a fucking issue. 
Um, and then going down Spring Garden and this one big guy, I forget what happened. He kind of got my way or something. And just like, I mean, this, this is, this is not a one, this is like not the one story. This stuff happened all the fucking time, but just like, Hey buddy. But this dude was like giant. And he was like, Hey man, sorry for getting your way. Went to shake my hand and then like pulled me into this punch and just like totally winded me. And he was with all these girls who looked like nice people. And they were like fucking standing around laughing at me. And I was like, what is wrong with the world? You know what I mean? This dude's all dressed up with like a scarf and he's all like fancy looking and stuff. And I'm just like, like, you know, real slick looking dude. And I was like, what the fuck? You know, it's just like, I thought I escaped this because London is full of that. The difference between, um, because we have like a big, huge gap between um, economic uh, situations here. And like, you know, you go down Richmond Row and it's like, you're going to get your ass kicked if you're carrying a skateboard or look a little bit different. You know what I mean? Like, um, anyways, that's a whole other side note. But that drove me right into the arms of the straight edge movement, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. and, um, you know, and, and just not into substances. And I remember like begging my parents to be able to go to bars. And I was like, I swear, I'm not actually fucking drinking, but I'm smoking weed like a fiend. And I'm listen, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm um, listening to my hieroglyphics tape on the way there too. Uh, I don't know, but I loved, uh, of course I loved Cypress Hill. That was, that was, uh... of course, of course. Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. And because that was yeah. like, but that was like confusing for me because I had to, I was learning the slang, you know, in 91, listening to the self-titled tape. And I was like connecting the dots. And I was like, wait, these artists, when they say blunts, that's the marijuana weed drug they're talking about. Totally. And I was trying to figure out like, are they joking? Is it like a cheap movie where nobody would ever really do any of these things? Right, um, which also right. Would be underestimating right. the realism of a Cheech and Chung movie, but yeah, 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 <laughs> uh, that was confusing. I was like, well, I don't believe they're shooting everybody, so they're probably not using drugs either. Right, right, for sure, for sure. Well, it was also interesting for me too, coming from skate culture, where it's like all a lot of those words had like an like a like an analog towards. Uh, like a skate move, like there was blunt oh, slides. Yeah. And I was like, oh, a blunt slide, you know, like, right. or whatever. <laughs> and uh, just different stuff, you know, like that and other little things around. Um, but yeah, hey, so I wanted to round this off with with, uh, with, a, with an imaginary Wednesday question. Um, but before we get to that, let's quickly check out the comments here. Uh, Kira's talking about, uh, we build those boxes in a pandemic. Can you expand those boxes and try drugs? Yes, it's still okay. Hey, yeah, but in the pandemic, smoke your own joint. Um, don't pass it around. Um, um, yeah, uh, Scott DeRoss talking about the dangers of Pizza Corner. Uh, yeah. yeah, London was rife with fights. Rogue, you're right. Um, Richmond, Rowan, Ottawa. Richmond just sounds like a bad note. Western, yeah, Western was the, Western was the problem, Rogue. Uh, be, yeah, for sure. Choke says the Beach Boys of weed, meaning, uh, uh Cypress Hill. <laughs> That's Hill? fucking yeah. amazing. That's fucking amazing. But You're the right. final question... The final question I want to ask you um, was uh, what's something that didn't make the cut or was it all just perfect and there? And, uh, oh, Kira, Kira wants to ask a question. So we have two more questions. Kira, what's up? They got a question for you, homie. Oh, I can't see any of the... Okay. Yeah, All right, I'll wait. The typing is happening. Who makes the live performance of these songs better? Kira is asking if they make it better or if Tribe One makes it better. Oh, this is some drama. Oh, yo, a lot of... So, Halifax Rap Legend uh, is, like, one of my staple songs ever since I uh, started working on that record. Yes, and let's talk about that song before we answer the other question, too. But, yes, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. And so, I, I took it on a whole lot of tours, and I played it at a whole lot of uh, local shows, and... Kira got really good at backing me up on it to the point where uh, they would just take the third verse, um, just snatch oh. it right out of my mouth. I like it. And, uh, and kick it. And But when I was on the MC Chris tour with Tribe One and uh, Dr. Awkward, um, we played the same set pretty much, each of us, every night, 52 shows in a row in 60 days. So we all learned each other's songs inside and out, um, watching each other, watching, hanging out at the merch table. And like, just by default, they both wound up becoming like my hype, hype people for Halifax Rap Legend. Cause there's like, 
parts to do. Uh, and I will not say that Tribe 1 was better at it than, than Young K, the mayor. <laughs> I simply won't make that statement. But sometimes I've had, like, Nick Carrier's done, back me up on it. Oh, uh, yeah. Ryan Gitargamel Dargavel has uh, backed me up on it. So many homies have, like, come through and made that more fun with their presence. That's dope. Kira, that's a fucking good question. Um, give me a brief bit of insight on that song, or give us a brief little bit of insight. I just love that it pisses off other fuckers. Yeah. You know what well, I mean? So. A couple of years before I wrote the song, I had started um, on, I think it was on my MySpace page. I described uh, like my little tagline or whatever was uh, secret Halifax rap legend. Right, and, right, 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 right. And I immediately got um, messages on my, on my uh, MySpace from people who were bigger fans of other Halifax artists who were like, you got to take that off. There's no way. You don't, you haven't Jesus heard it. Jesus Christ. That's hilarious. And like, I was, you know, I was like, secret legend means nobody knows who I am. Like it's, it's supposed to be tongue in cheek, but also like, we're all bigging ourselves up as rappers. That's part of what's well, fun about That's what this. rappers do, right? Yeah. Um, so just let me say my bullshit. Uh, so I leaned into it and I leaned into it and that song came out of it. And the song, the, the hook is a little bit um, separate from the lyrics to the point where, like, there's not that much references to Halifax hip hop in the lyrics. Right. Right. Uh, at the end, I, I give a shout out to uh, um, Pulled Pork Sandwich, the first Pulled Pork Sandwich I ever had at the right. Diner. And uh, also the North End Diner, which was the breakfast spot for so many years. Uh, and it had just, I think it had just burned down. Oh, I wrote yeah. the song, yeah. But uh, those are really the only like regional references besides scratching Joe Run and on the hook, um, and Flex Man. But um, I just wanted like the Halifax hip hop scene meant so much to me growing up in it and absorbing it from the time I was a teenager, um, and I was, I like I was. I know that I was a legendary fan. I know that people talk to people in other scenes, it's stories of me, and maybe they were making fun of me. I don't care, like, about how I was up at, like, Kira met Pip Skid in uh, Manitoba somewhere, and uh, I think Scratch Bass had mentioned that they knew me, and Pip was like, that guy was always at the front row of all my shows, shouting my own lyrics in my face. <laughs> and like yeah i was because i loved everything that was going on isn't that yeah. an awesome thing <laughs> i'm a legend for that i'll yeah. take that legend i will wear that you legend um, yeah you're like i'm good enough to know your lyrics like, better than you do i like couldn't <laughs> yeah because i want somebody to know my lyrics like that you know right yeah yeah, they, yeah yeah for sure watching those people and loving what they were doing and being so invested in what they're doing developed a thirst in me to also be you know, make that same connection or the connection that I have somebody feel that connection with my work that I felt with their work, even if it's not a totally two way street. And like, so the, that scene and those magical days when you and I were playing shows mm -hmm. and, uh, and at all the shows and at all the DJ nights, like, um, where people were just playing the weirdest new rap and we're talking to our friends at the Kyber oh, yeah. and, and like, oh, yeah, that is myth of that's like bacchanalia that's like mythical party time uh mm -hmm. for me and it will always mm -hmm. be like I'm, I'm so proud i was there oh yeah hell yeah i was so happy to have come from london that had a really awesome mm -hmm. scene off and on for a while and then just dive right into the halifax thing pretty much at its peak you know mm -hmm. i yeah. think even maybe just like just as it was even start you know like getting in there and oh man it was so fucking dope so fucking dope man you were part um, of you were part of the peaking process also like it was thank you for saying that thank it you. was expanding at the time mm -hmm. like there had mm -hmm. been more maybe external interest um in the late 90s when it was like hip-hop groove murder records 
uh, mm. Buck and mm-hmm. Six Two, like. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like, as far as like shows and the excitement and the churning inwards of like mm. people on our level, like participating and having that spread, like you were throwing a lot of those shows and you were playing at a lot of those Word. shows. Word, man. Thank you. Thank you. It was fucking unbelievable, man. The energy was just, it's where I needed to be, man. Halifax. God damn. I love that. I, so I, got was, go- I got goosebumps underneath this jacket here. Um, <laughs> it was so I, uh, magical. I've had no energy ever since. I used it all up. Yeah, yeah, it's done. That's why all my... Yeah, anyways, nah, I don't know. Um, hey, uh, Scott DeRoss was saying that... Uh, shout out to Scott DeRoss, uh, yeah. who was also a major, major, a major part of that that whole thing. Uh, yeah. On so many levels, uh, from just getting people's albums out to booking shows to bringing new artists to, to everything. Um, more than I can even mention right now. Um, Scott DeRoss says that Jesse was more famous or more famous than the people on stage is a sentiment he's saying. Um, it ob- it is the homie. Um, check out it obelis's show. Um, his participation with the uh, with the Saskatoon rap folk rap uh, records guys, um, and also with uh, MC Homeless and all that. Those shows are amazing. I tuned in last night to see So So and uh mackie talk and uh actually we have those cats here next week next week and that's gonna be a real special episode we're very excited about that um uh oh two says dope dope uh long hair's telling me about he was with two Mex and chesky and chesky was talking about this new song he was doing that's fucking awesome chesky's the homie um and has come through here a lot and done some amazing story amazing shows here uh the mansta says uh uh, what's up? I was thinking about the first time I met Bastard in Hell's Kitchen. I think maybe he had open for you guys. Very possible. I remember he commented that he technically shouldn't have been there because he was still underage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Yeah, that cat was winning awards. That shows he wasn't even old enough to participate <laughs> in. That cat was amazing. Good call, man. So, I owed um, him. I owed him dubs when when he was too young to get into shows. He got at me on the Shabukto Community Net like pre. <laughs> Not pre-internet, but like pre-the internet we know today. And he was like a high school kid, and he was like, "I want to trade tapes." Because he had a he had a DJ mix he'd done, and I had some old Halifax stuff that he really he was doing his homework. I never did my part of the trip. I owe him that. Oh shit! You better get him that. You better get him that. Um, Growing up, Mike says, "Do Thesis and Ted Cruz have the same haircut right now?" I don't really keep up with Ted Cruz because he's a fucking piece of shit. But does he have a dope mullet going like this? Huh? Formed by not showering and wearing a toque and a hat all in the same day? Oddly <laughs> enough, yes. Probably. Probably. Um, yeah, man, he's a big fan. He's a fucking piece of shit. But, he, you know, he's always he's always on my Instagram trying to copy my hairstyles and do all that ish. I don't fucking know. Um, t- okay, so, hey. Need you to, um, we need to wrap this one up, but I want, I want you to tell us, was there anything that didn't make the album? Was there something, a, a tale that we did not cover or something important like that that you what, feel? What did not make the album, there's one beat that was slated for the album um, that I never felt like I was able to do. Um, that's like about the same quality as the rest of the record. You know, I made it from stuff that I dug at the same time I was digging the samples that I did use on the record. But as far as, like, songs that were written, I think that I was, uh... It's one of the few times that I had, like, a goal. Uh, like I had an end point in mind, so I really did, like, sort of fill it up from the inside. And, uh... It, uh... Yeah, so there's not really a lot of cutting room floor stuff besides that one beat. Okay, um, that's amazing. As far as stuff that we didn't cover, always, you know, I my brain oh, is too yeah. scattered to like come up with it. I'll I'll keep talking about my own shit for years to come. Uh, uh, yeah, nothing that I can like come up with. It just yeah, it means a lot to me that the record meant anything to anybody, and that uh, you know, it's got stuff on it that connects with some people, and hope that I hope that I get my next solo album which has been done for three out this wow wow 
I think it's got a home. Dope. Okay. Well, I need to hear about that. That's awesome. That's really, really dope. Um, Kira is so nice. Uh, they say that the record is so good that they literally fell in love listening to it. That's fucking rad. That's fucking rad. Uh, speaking of, oh, sorry. Uh, you want to say something else? I was just going to say that Kira had a, a pre mixed down version that had uh, like home demo takes of the vocals and like never. That's the version that Kira fell in love with and it, it never really quite got comfortable with the released mm, version. It happens. It happens. <laughs> and I was thinking I should take that, those premixes and make them like a free like bonus with the record now for the 10th anniversary. Oh, also apt remastered it. It's it's remastered. Um, as soon as he tells me it's like done, done, then I'm gonna put that um, online. I, just so that I don't take anything away from everybody, I'll also have the original master. Yeah, available, yeah, but, right. Um, I do. All versions are gonna be up. I do. Yeah, that's dope. That's dope. I because I do know, and there's even a term. And going back to the Dabod Rap Pod guys, they even talked about the term about like the demo. I don't know if they call it. This Joel Brit chart. I think Thesis was going to ask me about demoitis. It's a term I heard from Buck Two and explaining why he wouldn't send me any back burner mixes to listen to before they were ready. Um, is get demoitis and you get too attached to versions of and I thought that he made it up uh, I think ah, we got kicked ah, off ah, there ah, um, ah, yo ah, Joel you... of course it's fucking Joel man ah. all, all, the, all the computer problems are Joel's um, yeah did I get kicked off there or did you get kicked off you did I believe so so, you were were you about to ask about demoitis? That's what it is. That's what that's yeah. what Tim calls it when he won't let you back burner mix. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, there's but a also, term for it the dad bod rap pod guys talk about too. Also, Portishead uh, in the book about making dummy talk. They got too attached to some of their early mixes, so I thought Tim invented no the shit. Feel. Ah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, well, we should end it at this. Um, did the whole broadcast get cut, or was it just me who popped in and out? Just you. Thank God. My phone's been telling me it's, like, running out of batteries for, like, the last, like, 30 minutes. It's like, you, you got, you're fucked, buddy. You better go off soon. And it's, like, you know, little by little, it's just, like, less and less and less. So um, I'm glad we made it. Um, there was a lot of complications at the beginning of the show. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. Uh, mm. Shout out to my homies from Cali. Got long hair up on here. We got Itobolus. We got um, we got we got all the homies. Kira, Backburner, homies, Choke. We had um, the Mansta. We had Grown Up Mike. We had Newfusaurus um, Rex in there early. Newfusaurus Rex. We had uh, Mean Joe Tunes, Animal Street Records. The Posse. The list. The Posse. The Posse was here. And yo. Thank you, you guys, for tuning in. I know um, we had a lot to cover, but I'm really happy we did. And Jesse, thanks for sharing all the personal stories about the album, an album that I really love, um, and was really happy to like sit and explore this piece with you. That felt really good, and I hope everybody else goes and checks it out and likes it just as much as, as you. Yeah, it seems like they do. Seems like they do. Yabba dabba do. Hey, and remember next week we got um So So and Mackie coming up. Yeah. Um their new yeah. album, If and Only If, is I think you can get the pre order now, right? The video's out for uh At Endemic, uh Scott DeRoss handling that. Hmm. Great really writer, beautiful. great musicians. Yeah. Uh I've only seen So So perform live once and it was magical. It was incredible. Dope. Dope. That's all I'm going to say it. about that. 
Yeah, I saw Soso do a, sh- uh, a thing on their show uh, yesterday, and it was really dope. It was like a just a like a rap over some of the beats playing in the background. It was amazing. So classic. Uh, again, thanks everybody for for checking us out. Sorry, we were a couple minutes late at the beginning. My computer died. I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna do. I have no money to fix it. Might be talking to you on my phone again next week. Much love. Thank you. Be safe. Have fun. Uh, hug your friends and your family. I don't know. Just make sure you tell people you love them if you love them. <laughs> I love not, you, Jesse. Thank, thank you, brother. Love you too, buddy. Yeah.